It's the country with the largest economy in Europe, the country with the lowest youth unemployment rates in the European Union, the fourth largest economy in the world, and undoubtedly the great leader in the old continent in the last 20 years. For visual economic viewers, Germany has been a shining example of economic development in recent decades. In this video, we will explain the reasons why Germany has become Europe's superpower. We will tell you why its economy works so well, why its companies are the most competitive on the continent, and we will also discuss how the German nation was able to become even richer during the financial crisis of 2008. But pay attention. This video is not just going to be another video about how free markets, low taxes, and liberal policies have been the winning formula for the development of the country in question. None of that. As much as it may surprise some of you, and unlike other prosperous countries such as Switzerland, Ireland, or even Estonia, Germany is a very interventionalist country, even at the level of southern European countries such as Spain or Italy. Do you want some concrete examples? To help you see what I mean, take a look at this table. What you're seeing right now is the difference between gross salary and net salary, that is, after taxes, between Spain and Germany. The first conclusion is very clear. Germany has much higher taxes on labour than a country like Spain, where they are not exactly low, by the way. To give you an idea, of the magnitude of what we're talking about. German social security contributions alone account for almost 40% of the total wage costs of companies. But if we add income tax to that, the result is that German workers end up paying close to 50% of their salary in taxes. And of course, let's not forget the additional taxes such as VAT, wealth transfer taxes, or the corporate income tax, which exceeds 30% and is also one of the highest in Europe. Come on, it's a real drain. However, don't think that the interventionalism of the German state is limited to taxation. Far from it. For example, the German minimum wage is also one of the highest in Europe, reaching 1,600 euros per month. On top of that, the bureaucratic hurdles are not exactly light either. For example, as you can see, they make this country one of the slowest countries when it comes to setting up a new company. And if we consult the OECD's Doing Business ranking, we will see that Germany is also one of the developed countries with the least legal resources for small investors, with the most administrative complexity for foreign trade, and with one of the worst bureaucratic structures in its property registries. In short, Germany is anything but a capitalist and free market paradise. And let's see, I imagine that in this situation, many of you are wondering about a few things. If it wasn't with free markets and low taxes, how is it possible that Germany has become so rich? What is the recipe for its enormous success? Could other countries imitate its model? So without further ado, let's answer these questions. Let's get started. If we want to talk about Germany's economic success, there is one thing we cannot forget. Germany was the big loser of World War II. And yes, I know this may seem obvious and insignificant, but think about it. After the war, Germany was a country that ended up in pieces. Its institutions were destroyed. Its territory and citizens were divided between East and West. And as if that were not enough, the whole country was condemned to pay $20 billion of the time in war reparations. However, despite all this, only 20 years after the Second World War, Germany had already overtaken France and the United Kingdom economically, becoming the leading economic power in Europe. Knowing this, the first question we have to answer seems very clear. How on earth could such a war-torn country end up becoming the continent's leading power in just 20 years? Well, visual economic viewers, the first answer can be found in the following map. For virtually all of modern history, since the Industrial Revolution, Germany, or at least what we know today as Germany, was one of the parts of Europe with the largest number of people with access to education. In fact, according to various sources we have consulted, back in the 19th century, the German region had higher literacy rates than even the United Kingdom of the Industrial Revolution. More than 80% of the young Germans were in school until they were at least 14 years old. Trust me, this is a lot for the 19th century. The point is that, unlike in other regions of Europe, where education was focused on the elite, the bourgeoisie and the nobility, in Germany the opposite was true. In Germany the education system was universal. Education was designed so that even the poorest could have access to knowledge and professional training. But why is this so important? Well, it is important because until World War II, Germany was a country based on industry. And not just any industry, but the most competitive and innovative industry in the world. At that time, Germany was the country with the highest number of patents in Europe. Germany invented things like the automobile, diesel engines, medicines like aspirin, Siemens blast furnaces, the electron microscope, and even the first computer in history, Konrad Zuse's Z1, which you can see in the image. The thing is, all these inventions and competitive industries would not have been possible without 
about citizens very well trained in subjects such as mathematics, chemistry, and physics. In fact, if you go to the list of Nobel Prizes at the beginning of the 20th century, you will see that Germany takes the grand prize in all these categories. Come on, they are the real dynamos in education. But be careful, because this is not the end of the story. Apart from having a very well-educated population, Germany also has a very strong business sector that was protected and encouraged by the government for years. For example, by forcing investors who invested in other countries to invest the same amount of money in Germany, or by allowing large companies to form cartels with which to dominate the market. Beyond this, the entire German region had good access to raw materials, such as coal, iron, and maritime resources, and also had an outstanding geographical position that allowed it to do business with a multitude of countries, especially when exporting the products of its huge and protected industry. In short, until the middle of the 20th century, Germany was a leading country with gigantic, highly innovative companies and the best educated population in the world. What could go wrong? Well, the Second World War. The war came, and with it the destruction and devastation of the country that we have just described. However, Germany was able to recover very quickly. We've already seen that within 20 years, the German nation was once again the leader in Europe. And do you know why? Well, because despite the war and all the destruction caused, the highly educated citizens, the entrepreneurs with their successful formulas, the patents, and the German productive culture remained intact. Let's say that all the ingredients of German success were still there in spite of the war. In other words, it only took the time to rebuild infrastructure, build and legal certainty before the German economy was able to take off again. Now, the interesting thing about all this is that the model of German success, which allowed them to recover from the war, has remained practically unchanged to this day. Even though almost 100 years have passed since all that we have described so far, the truth is that today's Germany looks like a modern copy of what it was in previous centuries. For example, what is their main business sector? Well, once again, advanced industry with high rates of innovation and scientific development. I think that in this case, a graph is the best illustration. Take a look. In 2020 alone, German companies and the German government invested more than 100 billion euros in research and development, a figure that is equivalent to more than 3% of GDP and doubles the figures of countries such as Italy, Italy or the United Kingdom. Meanwhile, its education sector tells a very similar story. Germans are one of the populations with the highest average years of schooling. As you can see in this graph, this allows companies to grow and develop much more than in other countries with less education. In addition, the German education system has a very, very productivity focused model. To give you an idea, German children are separated into three different types of schools from a very young age, according to their academic ability. That is, they put the children with the good grades together and separate them from those with poorer grades. This could be a problem at a social or inequality level, but at the same time, it has a great advantage the fact is that German children with the greatest academic potential, being all together, can be given more advanced curricula with which to make better use of their abilities, so that in the future, they can be the best engineers, physicists, or mathematicians working in innovative German companies. Now, does this mean that the rest of the less outstanding students are doomed to fail in school? No, that's not what we mean at all. Take a look. Half of all youngsters in upper secondary school are in vocational training, and half of these are in apprenticeships. Andreas Wargotter, head of country studies at the OECD. A large proportion of the young people who do not go to university in Germany prepare themselves through vocational training, a type of training that is highly adapted to the needs of the labor market, which trains young people in specific technical tasks that are much needed, and which also combines study with learning directly on the job. The German educational model is completely oriented to the labor market and the productive needs of the country. This is precisely the first reason for the great success of German industry, and thus of the German economy, its unique education system. The second reason has already been mentioned. Germany has a centuries-old tradition of entrepreneurship, innovation, and industry, which has been snowballing until present day. An entrepreneurial tradition that would be difficult to transfer to other countries, and which practically makes Germany a unique case study in the world. Be that as it may, these two reasons would be of no use without a third and fourth reason that we have not yet explained. They are perhaps the most important reasons of all. Reasons that have enabled Germany to maintain and expand its enormous industry and economic strength over the years. Do you want to know what we are talking about? Well, stay tuned. Surviving the Surge 
If a country has an enormous industrial tradition, even if it is very rich, even if the citizens are the most educated in the world, all this is of no use if its government throws it all away. A good example of this are countries such as Argentina and Venezuela. These countries once competed with the USA itself in economic terms for much of the 20th century. Recently on Visual Politic, we told you how Argentina came to compete with Switzerland and even became the richest country in the world for a time. However, with populist government after populist government, they have ended up with deep and long economic crises. Fortunately, the opposite was true in post-World War II Germany. If German politics in recent decades has stood out for anything, it has been precisely for its enormous stability, its great consensus, and the absence of large populist movements sowing discord and polarization. For example, the main parties of the left and the right have come to govern in coalition when they have not had an absolute majority, something that in other countries would be totally unthinkable. What's more, the stability and political consensus is not something that has been limited to the partisan sphere is, but has also been very present in civil organizations. But do you want a concrete case? Well, take for instance the case of the trade union groups. You see, unlike in other countries, where trade unions are little more than enemies of the companies and extensions of leftist political parties in Germany, trade unions are closely linked to business circles. What's more, German trade union groups even have representatives in the management and governing bodies of the companies. Thanks to this, both unions and companies can work as a team to seek a joint benefit. There is a dialogue. It is not a question of battling like cats and dogs, nor of seeing who is more radical than the other. But why is the political stability and the absence of radical movements so important? The answer lies in the long term. With radicalized and populist political groups, the objective of those in power is to achieve results and votes in the short term. Whereas with united political groups that seek consensus, it is much easier to carry out policies that pursue long-term objectives. And a great example of this was the German plan called Agenda 2010, a plan promoted by Social Democrat Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder in 2001, which served to save Germany from the 2008 crisis. By the way, we will talk more in depth on this topic in a future video, so subscribe. But in short, this plan was something like a great political consensus, whereby tax cuts, the relaxation of recruiting procedures, and reforms in the unemployment aid systems were agreed upon, with the aim of cleaning up the country's economic capacity. A country that at the end of the 90s, as you can see on the screen, was not going through the best of times. What's more, at that time, Germany was known as the sick man of Europe because of the huge crisis it was experiencing. How things have changed, right? Be that as it may, at the same time as German politicians carried out the 2010 Agenda program, trade unions and employers organizations followed suit. In this case, in order to face the problems of the crisis, the workers agreed not to ask for large salary increases in exchange for the employer's commitment to reducing the number of layoffs. In short, all these agreements served to find the best possible solution to the problems, a way out that left no one adrift. And again, this is just one example of many, but without a doubt, stability and political consensus have made Germany a very productive state. And that is why we rank these factors as the third reason for Germany's success. Now, this is not over yet. We still have the last reason of all. Pay very, very close attention. Less bread for today, much more for tomorrow. In Germany, the word for debt is Schulden, which in turn comes from the word Schuld. And do you know what Schuld means? It means guilt. Germans don't like going into debt at all. They are practically phobic about asking others for money. And the truth is that this has certain advantages. On the one hand, and as you can see on the screen, during periods of crisis, such as that of 2008, or the one suffered after the war in Ukraine, German companies had a much lower indebtedness than those of other countries, such as the US or France. This allowed them to hold out much better. The German government, on the other hand, has also been characterized by maintaining strict control over its public finances. Germany's public debt has remained much lower over time than that of other countries, such as Italy, Spain, or France. Again, this has allowed the country to be able to spend money when times were bad, and has allowed it not to drown its public accounts with higher and higher interest payments. However, all this financial health, beyond helping the Germans to weather the storm when the going gets tough, has also served to reap a second great advantage. Do you remember this graph? We used it to explain that Germany is one of the countries with the highest R&D investment in the world. Well, if this investment in German R&D is so large, it is precisely because both companies and the government, thanks to their financial health, can afford to make major investments in development. More specifically, public institutions have promoted major R&D intensification plans, such as the German government 
government's high-tech strategy, which has been decisive for the country's technological development. These plans have served to support and promote small, medium, and large companies such as Bosch or the Schaeffler Group. Companies that, as a study by BBVA research shows, are the largest creators of jobs and patents. So that brings us to the fourth element in Germany's recipe for success. It is precisely its ability to keep both public and private finances under control, and to leverage its resources to invest in and boost its advanced industrial sector. So there you have it. And having reached this point, it's time for all of you. Did you expect these to be the reasons for Germany's success? What other reasons that we have not explained can you think of to explain its success? Do you think that its model, despite being strongly influenced by its culture and tradition, could be applied in other countries? You can leave me your answers in the comments. If you liked the video, please give it a like. And if you don't want to miss the upcoming ones, subscribe and hit the little bell icon. And as always, see you in the next video. See you soon.